How's it going, apes? Welcome to another AP Environmental Science Lecture. We're going to kick off our air pollution chapter looking specifically at the types of air pollutants and then stratospheric ozone depletion by the end. So today the whole goal is to identify and describe the major pollutants and then describe the sources where these air pollutants are coming from. So it's important to kick off here that air pollution is a global system. So we talked about the atmosphere. The atmosphere envelops the entire globe and there's nowhere you can go without it. Obviously we need it to survive, but what's happening in one area we're gonna see can affect another. So perfect example is China. A lot of uh, industry going on in China, basically making the goods you and I purchase here in the United States. And the interesting thing is we're noticing is that the air pollution in Asia is resulting in acidic rain on the West Coast of the United States. So again, we can't run if we're in a country that doesn't have these types of industries or doesn't have restrictions on air pollution. Again, you cannot hide from it. So that's why we're going to look at it through a global system, not just a local or country by country instance as well. So let's get right into it. What is air pollution? Air pollution is just any introduction of these three things. But the key thing is it has to be in concentrations that are high enough to harm living things or even buildings and materials we'll see is harmed by air pollution as well. So that's the key. It has to be in high concentrations. And lastly, what it's going to do, it's going to alter an ecosystem. We learned about the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, things like that. But what's happened is this introduction of an influx of these pollutants into our atmosphere is now starting to alter ecosystems as a whole, which we'll notice by the end of this chapter. So just like any system, there are things going in, there are things going out. And sources of pollution, they do not originate from just one location, similar to when we talked about water pollution. So we all know we can get pollution from transportation. We'll talk about vegeta vegetation here in a little bit. Not that big of a deal. But those automobiles, planes, any sort of burning of fossil fuel, you're going to get an input. And then outputs, how are we getting these chemicals or these pollutants out of the air? You can see here, this is a picture in Mexico City. They, have a, they had, and they still kind of do a really bad ish, uh, problem with air pollution just because of the high population density and transportation. And you can see on those pillars, they call it Valle Verde, the, you know, the green way. And what they're doing, or the green road, is they put plants along those pillars. And what they notice is a drop in uh, air pollution. So what this is an output. So ways in which these is removed from the atmosphere. And vegetation does a great job. Soil will even do it, especially nitrogen and even clouds and even some particles and gases as well. So those are how we get them out. So now that we know the inputs and outputs, we're going to classify our pollutants. So to understand the global air pollution system, we have to identify the major pollutants and where they come from. And as I mentioned before, remember, atmosphere is a public resource. We considered a global commons, just when we talked about the tragedy of the commons before. The atmosphere is this global commons. Everyone has access to it. So in 1970, the United States developed the Clean Air Act, the U.S. Clean Air Act. And what it did is it identified six pollutants that threatened human well-being, ecosystems, and or structures. So we're going to look at those six right now. Starting off with sulfur dioxide. And as we go through each one, we're going to talk about the anthropogenic sources and then even the natural sources. So we all know anthropogenic is human caused. So you can see in the pie chart, it's mainly coming from this combustion of fuel. Um, and then even natural sources as well. You can have forest fires, you can have volcanoes emitting sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. But again, the major contribution is the combustion of fossil fuels. And so for each one, we're also going to look at the effects and impacts. And you're going to notice kind of this reoccurring theme, that second bullet, a respiratory irritant. A lot of these, remember, we're breathing them in. These are harmful pollutants. Not only do they harm a corrosive agent is an example of uh, harming buildings, but it's going to harm our bodies as well when we inhale them. And they will, these will even affect plant tissue. So that's a potato plant there. And you can see what happens is sulfur dioxide will convert to sulfuric acid. And we know it comes back down to the earth as rain. So not only does it harm the plants, but it will also end up in, or decreasing the pH in uh, bodies of water, making them more acidic. On the nitro... Nitrogen oxides, want to throw this in real quick. Notice it is NOx. The reason why we put the X is all we're doing is we're indicating there may be one or two oxygen atoms 
per nitrogen atoms. It could be nit nit nitric oxide or it could be nitrogen dioxide, but the key thing is, is these are nitric nitrogen oxides. That's all you need to know for this. And the way they get into the atmosphere is, again, through motor vehicles, mainly through fossil fuels, combustion of fossil fuels, but then also forest fires, lightning, and even microbes will emit them into the atmosphere as well. So what are the effects? Again, we have that respiratory irritant. It can lead to photochemical smog, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And then in the atmosphere, it will convert to nitric acid, nitric acid, which again will end up in aquatic systems and harm the plants and animals living there as well. And we all know what goes on with eutrophication. So too many nutrients in a body of water. And you, we already talked about how it increases hypoxia. You have the die-offs, and again, which is happening in the Gulf of Mexico. Carbon oxides, there's two of these when you know, know about carbon monoxide, you have this incomplete burning of matter. So usually not unclean or unrefined forms of fuel like kerosene or even burning manure and coal, you don't burn the entire thing clean, so you end up with carbon monoxide and then even carbon dioxide. This is just the complete burning of matter, but I want to throw this in here though that this wasn't added into the Clean Air Act until 2012. Scientists developed gathered a ton of data and what they started to realize is carbon dioxide, yes, it's a greenhouse gas and what it was, they noticed it was doing, it was altering ecosystems in a drastic way and in a, in a huge way in um, global climate change. So we will look more at carbon dioxide later when we talk about global climate change, but know that it wasn't added until 2012 and it is a um, major pollutant now, air pollutant. Sticking with the effects and the impacts, uh, carbon monoxide pollution is high in urban areas. Again, we're lots where there's a lot of fossil fuels being burned. Indoor air pollution. Um, a lot of us probably have carbon monoxides in our home. That's just to let us know if it's in there. Because remember, it's colorless and odorless. And then finally, like I mentioned, that CO2 is now a major greenhouse gas. So if you look over at the graph on the right, for the past 650,000 years of data we have on the amount of CO2 that's been in the atmosphere, you can set, see it did rise up and down as the years went by, but if you look closer now that it has never reached above 300 parts per million. In 1950, it got above, and what we're noticing now is that every year there's more and more CO2 in the air, and we, all, we know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and it does um, cause, it is, it is heat trapping, causing temperatures to rise. And again, we'll talk more about that as we move on. If you'd ever like to see the current CO2s, there's a great link here. You can go check it out. Um, and what they're doing is Mauna Loa has been gathering data for years. I mean, you can get the full record. But what we notice is, again, this is the amount of CO2 since the 1960s, and it's been on a steady rise. And there's even a video, if you'd like to check that out, on the what's been going on through the um, – data that they've been collecting and the amount of CO2 being contributed to the atmosphere. And again, we'll talk more about this as we move on. Particulate matter. Particulate matter, it could be a solid, it could be a liquid, but what is it suspended in the air? We Humans put that in the earth when we have burned fire from wood, animal manure, you have biofuels. These, again, coal, oil, giving off particulates. And then even forest fires, lightning, and you can see in the picture there, volcanoes will put particulate matter in the air as well, along with soil microbes. And the interesting thing about particulate matter, so to give you an idea, the your hair is about 50 to 100 microns um, in diameter. So the EPA measures this and determines if it's a pollutant. If it's over 10 microns, our nose and our throat can filter that. If you breathe it in, it'll get trapped by your nose, it'll get trapped by your lungs, it won't harm you. So the EPA does not regulate the um, particulates that size. When it gets smaller than 10, or they call it PM10, that's when we get a little concerned because what that can do is that can be deposited within our respiratory tract. If it gets even smaller, if it's less than 2.5, It'll go even deeper in our respiratory tract, but the interesting thing here is it's composed of more toxic substances. So the smaller things are usually toxic things like copper, metal, lithium, metal. Like, a, And if we go more to the right, we'll get deeper into our lungs, and this is where we usually see metals 
once they get in our bloodstream can cause cancer, genetic illnesses, and uh, diseases later on in life, which is why it should be a concern. And looking here at the pollution of PM under 2.5, it all depends on where you live. So you can see the United States, it's unspecified sources of human origin, but if you go to other places, where you have maybe on the coast, there's soil dust or sea salt or more industrial nations. So depending on where you live, there's different types of particulate matter. Uh, increase in particulate matter can cause haze, and all hazes is reduced visibility. So here's the same place, Beijing, taken at two different times. You can see the bottom picture. We're on a hazy day. Um, and all it's doing is scattering the light. Sometimes we see it a lot at sunrise and sunset just because it involves those colors. Moving on to photochemical. Photo means light. So what we have here is this is happening. Sunlight's getting in on the action, and it's taking chemical compounds, usually nitric oxides or sulfur dioxide, and it's forming something else. The one we're really concerned with is ozone, and we'll see how it forms here in a second. Another one is smog, is where you take oxidants and you take particulate matter, and then another that's an, an involved light that is um, a photochemical oxidant as well. And interestingly enough, there's types of photochemical smog. So there could be the LA type smog, where it's mainly brown smog. It's a result of oxidants, usually ozone. And these, again, are coming from transportation, cars, buses. That's the type of smog you see in LA. Whereas sulfurous, sulfurous smog, that's due to industry. Sometimes it's called London type, or it's the gray smog, or industrial smog. And again, these are dominated by sulfates, or sulfur dioxide, usually the result of burning coal. So depending on where you are, if it's uh, transportation, it's that LA smog. If it's gray or from industry, it's sulfurous, sulfurous smog. Something we're starting to learn about now, though, is called atmospheric brown cloud. And this is a little scary because what we're doing is we're combining the two types of smog. So you have your particulate matter, you have your ozone, and the two are combining to these brown clouds. And what they do is they just sit there. And they'll sit over cities. And here's a few examples. The one in La Jolla, you can see it off in the distance. But again, these combination of part LA smog and sulfur smog and just forming these clouds is pretty nasty. So we talked about how, yes, visually uh, smog or pollutants are not good. Um, Health-wise, they're horrible. But there's even a monetary and economic and tourist uh, issue we have to look at too because you have you know you want to go to La Jolla or you want to go to the beach to breathe in the nice air you want to go to a national park to see the clear skies and get um, away from that unhealthy air but again remember this is a global issue so this Joshua tree is a perfect example you have air flowing from LA into a valley and again you have people going to escape from the city and here it is the city air is waiting for them so another aspect of air pollution that needs to be addressed moving on to a couple more these will go quick because you've heard them before lead um, back in the day um, gasoline was had they added lead and what it did is it improved the important performance of the car, but the car would burn the gasoline, lead would be in the atmosphere, and we know all about the detrimental effects of lead. We did, No more lead in the United States. If you go fill up your car right now, you are filling with unleaded, but um, there are still places worldwide where they add lead to the fuel. And then finally, mercury. We know mercury is a result of burning coal. That ends up in the atmosphere, usually in our waterways, um, and then eventually through the food web. Remember that biomagnification. There's a little mercury in the uh, bacteria in the water, but then as it moves up the food chain and then into humans who maybe eat tuna, um, that's when we see a huge um, issue. Volatile organic compounds. If it has a, an aroma, um, it's probably a VOC. So what these do, these contain hydrogen and carbon. They're compounds with, the, like I said, these very strong aromas. So again, gasoline, lighter fluid. You guys have all maybe opened up a can of paint and you smell those fumes. Those are VOCs. These are not necessarily hazardous. I'm not telling you to go and sniff a bunch of paint or glue or markers or don't sniff anything. What I'm getting at is they're not necessarily hazardous because they don't cause direct harm. For, for example, you've maybe been on a hike through a forest and there's a lot of pine trees and you can smell the pine trees. That's a VOC. It's not harmful. But VOCs can lead to the formation of photochemical oxidants and which that's, we just learned, are 
harmful. So they are an issue to, in regards to air pollution and scientists are really looking at these in regards to their contribution to um, how much air, air or pollutants are being put into the air. So we want to get rid of these things. We want to attempt to reduce pollution emissions. What we got to do is find out where they are coming from. So there's primary and there's secondary and almost similar to when we learned about water pollution. Um, primary is we know directly where they're coming from. So in the picture there, that exhaust from that car, we know pollution is coming from that car or that smokestack or whatever it is or that volcano that's erupting. That's primary. Secondary are those what's happening uh, like photochemical. Remember sunlight was involved in the form of to form ozone. And the interesting thing about these is you need sunlight and you need water when you get these secondary pollutants to form. So we see a lot of secondary pollutants um, in warm, humid regions. So something to keep in mind. And like I said, ozone is a perfect example. Here you have ozone in the atmosphere. It's perfectly fine. You're breathing it. No worries. Nitric, nitric oxide coming from your car that is running. It's a sunny day. It breaks up that nitric oxide. That oxygen needs somewhere to go. It hooks up with that O2. Now we have O3. We have ozone at ground level. And here you go. You're breathing in that ozone. Just an ingredient in smog. And here are all the uh, effects it has on a person's health. So again, not a good thing. Finally, we're going to wrap it up. There are natural sources. There are anthropogenic, which we've been talking about quite a bit here. So I'm going to go over these really fast. We talked about the natural emissions when we went over each one. Make sure you know those. And we know human caused are um, putting these in the atmosphere as well. I want you to take a little look though at that graph because we've kind of talked a lot of uh, a lot of bummer things in this class, but you know, you, and again, you saw those pictures of LA or China with all the smog. But here you have from 1990, uh, 20 years, and the amount of these pollutants in the air. And you can see a trend with lead being the most, which is interesting enough. Look at 1996, we got rid of lead gasoline. It's been dropping, but they're going down. So, you know, as technology, as science improves and people are educated, um, this is a fixable problem. It's just one of those things we got to work at. So kind of wanted to leave you with some sort of good news. And again, this is good to know just because it gives you an idea of where a majority of these pollutants are coming. So carbon monoxide, obviously from um, transportation, you have your uh, nitrogen oxides coming from transportation as well. The sulfur dioxide is usually burning from coal. That's why it says electricity generation. And that particular matter, remember, it can be under 10 in this case, they're doing 2.5, but it comes from many different sources. So that does it on air pollution. Something you might want to check out if you have some time, there's this uh, website called Air Quality Now, and if you hit on it, you can type your zip code, and um, it will show you the air qualities of that location at that given moment of time. So you can, again, see, is there an ozone issue? What are the particulates? 10. We have a moderate today. 2.5 is good. And again, it tells you kind of just some things to look for. So there you go. I hope you're um, understanding all this. If not, always come and see me, ask questions, and uh, listen with the sound on. That always helps too. See ya.